We're very excited to be here today at the Nevada Museum of Art to see the phenomenal show, The World Stage. And we're with the fabulous curator, Joanne Northrup, who really came up with this theme and came up to the office and went through 150 of our binders and suddenly the inspiration came to do this survey of probably the leading artists today in, uh, in this country. So the theme, The World Stage, um, how did it come to you and how did you arrive at who you picked as we will walk through the galleries, but how did you make your selections? <laughs> well, thank you for asking, Jordan. Um, I was really inspired by um, a Life magazine article and photograph from 1951 um, that you might have heard of. It's called The Irascibles, and it had all the ABEX artists like Jackson Pollock who were prominent in the mid-century of the 20th century. And so I was thinking to myself, who are the artists that occupy the world stage today? And so I deliberately chose a diversity of artists um, that represent the world stage of the 21st century. So that's how I went about it. Wonderful. Well, should we start off with uh, the Kinda Wiley? That's the front painting you walk into? Sure, the namesake of okay. the exhibition because this painting is actually from the series that Kinda Wiley painted called The World Stage. And this is from The World Stage Brazil. Um, and what he did with this painting is he went to Rio de Janeiro and noticed all the equestrian statues of politicians and, and great leaders of Brazil. So he was inspired by that statuary in the city and went and recruited models in the street. Um, they wore their own clothes and then they ha he had them pose in um, so that they were sort of mimicking um, the look of an equestrian or a statesman like a statue. So you see um, the young man on the right is, is holding a piece of, of bamboo. That might have been a sword in the original sculpture. So he's enabling these young men of color, these, these uh, Afro-Brazilian young men, to occupy that place of power. Um, and that is why he called this series The World Stage, and that's why I borrowed the title for this exhibition. So let's focus, uh, let's go down here and focus on it. So born in 1977 in Los Angeles, uh, he lives in New York now, got his MFA at Yale, and initially he took photographs of young men in Harlem, and, uh, and uh, the portrait artist that he is uh, made images of them. And then he began to look around the world to uh, other places where there was uh, the uh, African American black men and women, and he started doing images of people from Senegal and Dakar and Mumbai and places in Africa. And that began to shape and form his work. And then he had a, a, a fellowship to go to Brazil in 2008 and 9, and that's where this world stage theme came from. And as we just heard, he uh, had models down there, and often uh, athletes or or prominent uh, uh, young men and women, and then he did his Kanda Wiley thing. What is it that's going on here? From time immemorial, for all of us, from the time we were little that would go to a museum, we would see portraits. Portraits are the oldest form of art. Whether it's portraits of horses in the caves of France, or whether it's all the work in the Renaissance, you name the period. But we generally see white, Men and women of stature, prominent people, okay? All those images from England and of fancy people in their dresses or women and men standing up, uh, you know, powerful images. So what does he do? He shows us average street people, people from the slums, athletes, others, in powerful images, but they're black Afro-American men and women. So it throws us. And he does exactly what artists are supposed to do. They're supposed to take us, suck us into the work, and then just start making us go through all the motions of thinking what's going on here. Now, if you look at these images, look at them. They're, first, they're huge scale. So he's giving great scale, reminiscent of those big portraits of English lords and kings and queens and European, German, and other royalty. But he's put it on a big scale. Second of all, if you look at them, what hits me, and I'm sure all of you, is the defiance in their look. That proud defiance of looking at you, and that really takes us. 
So I think the tension he creates that's amazing, and the reason why President Obama picked him to do his portrait, was he takes the typical stereotype reaction we have of looking at white <laughs> folks, and he gives us African-American black folks, and that tension of those two catches us and forces us to think about our values and how we uh, come up with the attitudes we have. Brilliant, brilliant artist, and he now is one of the leaders of maybe 10 or 15 or 20 uh, black African-American artists, both men and women, that I think are doing the most phenomenal work uh, in this country now and around the world. Let's start off in here. I think it was fascinating that you picked. I mean, you've got a number of ethnic and gender artists in here. Uh, Wendy Redstar is a favorite of mine. Uh, we have a lot of her work. Uh, but why did you pick her? What did you see in her work? Because she's not as well known. She's a rising star, not as well known as Kinda Wiley. But why did you pick her work? I'm so happy that you did. Well, uh, Wendy Redstar is actually well known to our visitors at the Nevada Museum of Art. Um, she's been in previous exhibitions at the museum, and her work was very well received by our visitors. But I found this series especially interesting because um, Wendy Redstar, who is a Crow Indian, who's based in Portland, um, is not really primarily a printmaker. So what she did is she did these color studies, but the central uh, image is a res car. And um, Wendy talks about how when she was growing up on the Crow Reservation in Montana and how she and her friends and her siblings played in these abandoned cars in the front yard that needed to be fixed and how it became sort of an area where she felt wealthy in culture and wealthy in friends and family. So I love to have um, Wendy Redstar's work juxtaposed with some of the most important artists um, you know, of the 20th century. Right next to Wendy is a phenomenal work, Madam Butterfly by Helen Frankenthaler, who was one of the uh, second generation abstract expressionist artists in New York. Helen Frankenthaler, like many uh, uh, female artists of her time, uh, had, uh, had unfortunately huge glass ceilings that they kept bumping up against. Uh, I saw a show a few years ago of uh, oh, Elaine de Kooning, a number of the, the, some of the wives of the famous uh, uh, artists of the time, and I thought actually their work was probably better than their husband's work. Uh, this is a, a, a tour de force because this is 102 um, uh, runs through the press, meaning each color okay, was a separate time, it was put on the paper, the ink was put on the paper, smashed down, they had to let that dry, then run it through again 102 times. So just from a technological standpoint, she was one of the first artists that really pushed the envelope of prints and multiples. And for that alone, she just is on a pedestal for me. This work in particular, the way she used the wood block, the wood uh, um, uh, image behind it with these colors. She was famous for letting uh, color ink oils uh, drip on her work where they would sort of have their own organic uh, way of, of taking nature onto uh, canvas and paper. Brilliant, brilliant artist. Uh, what do you like about this work? Well, what I like is the fact that Helen Frankenthaler was the artist who invented color field painting. She's the first artist who really poured, um, poured paint onto unprimed canvas in her work. And she's translated that technique for which she's known into the printmaking medium. And she makes it look like it could be a watercolor. I think it's one of the most beautiful prints I've ever seen and it's clearly something that you know in contrast to the simplicity of Wendy Redstar's forms it is enormously complex and again she was doing this at a time when most of the other artists of her generation were the pop artists doing work about materiality consumerism and so forth and she went back to another time and place being a, a, it's a color field artist taking colors and doing things on canvas and on paper that just hadn't been done before so she was just as important as any of those other artists, and uh, the work is breathtaking, just from a technological standpoint, inventive standpoint, and the imagery itself. 
just takes my breath away. And while I love every single thing she does, I think this is probably, in my opinion, the best thing she ever did, irrespective of works on canvas, paper. This just says it all. And this is just her. When I first saw these works at High Point, a publisher in, in uh, Minneapolis, I just, just couldn't stop thinking about what was going on. Obviously, you look at this, and the first thing you think is an iron. And you think about irons. And you think about who uses irons. You know, moms generally, grandmothers, aunts, household staff, housekeepers. Same time, his image of an iron is reminiscent of a slave ship. So here he's taking a familiar object that we all see, that same word I used before, he seduces us, just like Kinda Wiley did, like these other artists, he gets us to look at this very familiar, wonderful, lovely object that we all feel uh, pre-existing sort of warm feelings about. Okay, maybe you remember your mother ironing your clothes, maybe you tried to iron your own clothes as a kid and suddenly burned a hole in it because you weren't doing it right. But then you're hit with this stark reality of a huge cultural statement about the slaves being brought to this country against their will. Um, it just, uh, it just uh, speaks volumes. Uh, why did you pick this work? Well, I've been a huge fan of Willie Cole's work for many years. And the thing that attracts me to his work is that he uses a pop sensibility and pop colors. Um, to create works that are deeply personal. His mother and his grandmother raised him, and the way that they made money for supporting their family was to take in laundry. So they did the washing and the ironing for the white folks in their neighborhood. Um, so I think that these works can be seen as an homage to his female relatives who raised him and made him the strong artist that he is today. Um, I would also say that this exhibition opened in March 2020, and in June 2020 we had the Black Lives Matter protests across the nation, and now it's really worldwide. Um, and Willie Cole is an artist who was working in educating people about the Black American experience far before the protests happen. He's been at it for decades, and I think that he's an artist that everyone should know about, and that's why this exhibition is more than just an art exhibition. It's a way for visitors to educate themselves about the important leading black American artists of the United States. These are four stunning works by Micheline Thomas, who, uh, like Kinda Wiley, is sort of top of the heap today in terms of her, her, her national recognition. Uh, born in Camden, New Jersey in 1971, um, ends up uh, uh, going to Pratt and has an MFA from Yale. But interestingly enough, coming from Portland, she came to Portland because she initially thought she wanted to be an attorney, okay? And uh, she came and worked at a law firm, Davis Wright Tremaine, for seven years and went to Portland State University and then concluded that she really wanted to, to, to do art. Um, so her work um, has been very influenced, as she discusses, by Matisse, the Hudson River School, uh, Manet, and there's a lot of very traditional artists. And one thing to note here, because I talk about the educational experience of these artists, is most all of them here didn't just inherently as a kid, they may have gotten into art, but they went to art school. So someone often says, when they see this contemporary work, they'll say, ugh, why can't they just paint these nice mountains and bowls of fruit and stuff? And the answer is, they all can and they all did. When they were in school, they had to do all the same kind of artwork that whether it was Andy Warhol or Jasper Johns or you name it. Uh, but then they end up going out on their own and pushing their envelope to come up with work that's never been done. So she loves on these architectural works uh, the sort of themes of the 60s and 70s. And yet she takes uh, all sorts of uh, uh, that modern, that, 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 that contemporary look then, and she manipulates it into this all-encompassing, sort of just takes you into a world of all these sort of shapes and forms and, and, and colors, and just does it brilliantly. Uh, I think her most powerful work is the work she uses of women and nudes and uh, women in, in various uh, reclining post postures and so forth, but uh, 
Uh, these are stunning, and Joanne, why'd you pick these? <laughs> um, well, thank you for asking, Jordan. Um, Mickleen Thomas um, is one of the most important uh, black American queer artists working in the contemporary art world today. And as Jordan said, she really is known for her works that uh, use black American models and they resemble odalisques of, of the past centuries. Um, but I wanted to show another side of Thomas's work. I wanted to show that she's a very versatile artist, so I chose these interiors and then the landscape, particularly as the landscape relates to the Nevada Museum of Art's focus on art and environment. Um, and I just think she's phenomenal, and I love her art historical references. I think the Matisse reference is right on the target. So I chose them because I wanted to create a bright, colorful gallery, and I think her work does that. And again, if you think about artists in general, they are always chroniclers of our time. They also build upon the legacy of those who came before them. So back to that Hudson River School, if you think about those images of the Hudson River and the mountains and the trees and the pastoral scenes, which those artists then were pushing that envelope. But look at how she uses this imagery of the waterfalls, of the mountains, but in a very contemporary way. So she's reaching back and paying homage to an art period that was very influential to American artists, but she's doing it in her own way and she owns it with what she's done here. Uh, in, a, in an interesting way, almost like Picasso or David Hockney, where they take scenes and manipulate them and in doing so in their, in their gifted way, help us come into the world of their art. I mean, who would think of taking all these sort of pieces and camouflaging them and cutting them out and painting them printing them and whatever and putting them all together in this sort of unorganized way that all relates to each other and speaks to a, a state of consciousness for the viewer that takes you into the, uh, the natural world. Just brilliant. Just brilliant. Uh, you see these, it's again, a very comforting sort of, it takes you back to a time when in our mind things were calmer in society. Okay. So wonderful. Well, uh, Jacob Hashimoto's work is well known uh, to Nevada Museum of Art audiences because we once had a major sculptural installation in our atrium and it was made up of these paper fans. And the paper fans are actually, that's his artistic, his visual vocabulary. And the reason why I selected this piece is because I think that it's almost like a lexicon of the images that he uses and reuses in all his art. So I just thought it was fascinating as a study of form and color. Yes. So I first saw his work, uh, Durham Press and Tandem both have published his work and loved it first when I saw it. And those works were full of buttons and sewing things and all sorts of uh, uh, f f different objects. And uh, when I saw this piece, what I loved about it was, as you said, this was like a codex, an index, to all these little things he puts in all his other's works that you think, God, where's he come up with all these buttons and things and whatever? And uh, so this work uh, is like, uh, like a hieroglyphic. It's like the Rosetta Stone, okay? <laughs> this helps you see all the things he uses. And what's fun about this piece is we asked before when we bought it if it was supposed to be displayed in a particular order and the answer was no in fact he liked the idea that each time it was put up it would be in a different order so there's no particular order to put these in so it actually is like a living a living organism because each time you would present it it would be in a different configuration so it keeps changing and the viewer's response to it is moved by the particular order or disorder of how the uh, the various little images uh, are put on the put on the wall so uh, really fun okay so Caitlin Cherry so this is interesting um, so um, Kara Walker is right now probably the most important uh, African American black artist in the country and uh, Kara Walker grew up in Stockton okay father was an art teacher at 13 they moved to Atlanta and that's when she talks about the first time she really felt felt some racial prejudice so um, we've had uh, all of her works, and we did a show of her works that started at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento, went to the Jordan Central Museum of Art in Eugene, then went to seven other cities. We funded symposiums and everything. I got a call from a woman named Loretta Yarlow. She was the director of the UMass Amherst in Amherst uh, uh, Museum. 
and she said, please, I've heard about this show, can we please uh, have it? I said, no, it's been a six museums, it's got a rest. Well, she was so pers persuasive, I said, okay, fine, already you can have it. Well, it's a wonderful campus, and uh, so in terms of funding it, they had an idea, and we funded a artist in residence of a younger artist that Kara Walker would pick, and so they picked a lady I'd never heard of, um, uh, this Caitlin Cherry, and um, uh, so, um, um, born in Chicago, lives in New York, and so she came up and spent two weeks as an artist in residence in the art school at UMass Amherst, and uh, so I either got or bought this print that she made there. So this was Kara Walker's choice of a younger artist, born in 87, um, and, um, and did this work. Now this series is a fascinating one, because I think what Jeff Koons is trying to do is he often goes back in time, paying homage to those who came before him, but then manipulating the work in his own way to build upon their legacy, but with a contemporary spin. Uh, he also does these uh, big balloon dogs and, and different kinds of sculptures that, that I think plays upon consumerism, materialism, and uh, our view about objects today and building upon Warhol's theme of the democratization of art, saying again, hey, look around us. Art is all around us. It's not just in museums. Here's a big balloon dog. Here's a plant, uh, whatever. Now with these works, what he did is what he talked about is when he was growing up in Pennsylvania, uh, the farms, he said everybody's yard had a gazing ball. Gazing balls were these glass, okay, sort of luminescent, reflective balls in their gardens on a stand and when you would go up to it, you'd see your own image in it, as well as because it was round, a sort of a 300, 180 degree from each side sort of view of things around you. And he was always fascinated by that. So one of the things he's done, just like the Rauschenberg piece we'll talk about in a second and others, is by putting a gazing ball in a work, he was going back in time to something that was very important in his growing up, but he also makes you part of the art so instead of just looking at this Van Gogh work that's so famous, okay, the wheat field that you know is in all the museums and so forth, he's now putting you in the wheat field so you're part of this amazing Van Gogh painting. And so he did six of these, each with major, major artworks that everybody knows. This is Klimt with the famous painting of his, and uh, uh, just brilliant. So think about this. You want to be an artist. We all took art in grade school. We all doodle on a napka, on a doily at a restaurant. We've got some crayons and whatever. So we're all artists. But to become an artist, the Joanne Northrup and the Nevada Museum of Art were put in these walls, unless it was a Saturday art show for local residents to submit your work, which might be a fun exhibition. But if you want to be on these walls, on walls of other major museums around the country, a couple things have to happen. First, probably genetically, <laughs> you need to have a predisposition towards an aesthetic. Either you got it or you don't, okay? Second of all, you've got to have the guts to be willing to do some art where you rip open your soul and put it on a wall, make a sculpture, whatever form it's in, and say, here everybody, look at what I've done. And be ready for the criticism, the attacks, whatever that you get. And third, you've got to do something that's not been done. So if we merely had, without this gazing ball, if we just had this sort of representation of this Klimt painting, or we had this Van Gogh painting here, and it was by Jeff Koons, I'm not sure it would make any sense for it to be in the museum. If they wanted to do a show of major imposters and people who copy art uh, and try to rip off the public and try to claim, that might be one kind of show. But what he's done is he's done something different. Okay, no one's ever quite done this thing with a gazing ball. Other people have done work that draw you into it, but very, very creative. So he drew upon something in his own lifetime, his own experience that meant something to him. He paid homage to those artists that he, uh, that he looked upon as heroes. And he brought those two things together so we could experience uh, something that's really quite charming and intriguing, and again, very seductive. Leonardo Drew, 
So for a number of years, I have sponsored a speaker series at the uh, International Fine Print Dealers Association Print Fair. So about four or five years ago, Dick Solomon, the legendary uh, owner of Pace Prints, called up and said, hey, I've got an idea for you about a guy named Leonardo Drew. I said, who is he? He said, Jordan, you will love him. I said, show me some images of his work. He sent some images and the print addict that I am, I said, I've got to have those. And uh, so I bought some prints of his. And then a few, few months later, we uh, came to the print fair and uh, heard him talk. And he is amazing, handsome, brilliant, great smile, uh, loquacious, just talkative and full of energy. And I just was so taken. And since that time, we've acquired a number of his sculptural pieces, works on paper. Uh, I talk to him every week, every other week. Uh, his amazing studio in Brooklyn and just a phenomenal, phenomenal human being. So what he does is he takes what I would think initially, and all of you would, he takes a bunch of old wood, okay, but it's not. He takes new wood and he makes it look old. And he loves this textural, um, uh, again, that natural order, and yet uh, very thought out. And I love that tension between something looks like it just happened, and yet everything was quite planned. Now it's interesting when you talk to him and say, well, tell me, uh, I remember when I went to Ellsworth, Ellsworth Kelly studio, he had a pad on his desk and he would mathematically come up with the formulas about the angles of his work, the shapes, the geometric forms and so forth, mathematically, very scientifically thought out, and then he would do his work. Roy Lichtenstein, he would end up sort of creating, he would draw first the outline of what he wanted to do, and then he would start filling in the painting, whatever. When you talk to Leonardo and say, well, how did you come up with this idea? He says, well, I don't know. I come in the studio and I have a bunch of stuff there and I've been to a studio a bunch of times. He's got wood all over the place and shingles and, and uh, branches and tree stumps and whatever. And he says, I just start taking the stuff and I just start making it. So what he says his inspiration comes from is he loves to travel. He went down before the COVID thing. He went down to Costa Rica, he went to Belize. He goes to other places just for three or four days, just to walk around and experience things. Then he goes back to the studio and almost in a similar way to those abstract expressionists to Rothko and Jackson Pollock where you know they go in there and not have to think about their work they go straight that Jungian from the mind to the canvas and he'd throw his paint down and whatever uh, Leonardo goes in the studio I hadn't thought about this before he goes in the studio and he just lets his mind take him on his artistic journey and out of that comes these remarkable forms and shapes and powerful pieces now as to what I think when I see these, uh, there are some artists that uh, just grab me intellectually. Everything Warhol does. My gosh, you could write a, uh, a book on every single work, the social commentary. With his work, I think it, uh, uh, it's a different reaction. Uh, while this work reminds me of almost looking like at a Manhattan from the sky, looking down on Manhattan at all the tall buildings and everything, um, it just is a, 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 a it just, draws me into uh, something with wood and organic material, and yet he's painted it black. Um, it just takes me on uh, that word journey again into a creative exploration, like you were a little kid uh, grabbing things and just putting them all together and just seeing what it all looks like. Uh, just a, 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 a brilliant interpreter of shapes and forms and the world around us. Uh, Why do you like it? I think it's amazing that Leonardo Drew in the 21st century can find something new um, in terms of abstraction. That he can take wood and create this sort of cityscape and that he uses the absence of color, black, um, to just really draw you in. This is an artwork that's best experienced in person because um, it's very difficult to photograph, but in person it just sucks you in and you you almost feel like you're part of it so I think it's really just the most inventive use of abstraction in the 21st century that I can think of Lorna Simpson uh, born in 1960 is uh, slightly older than uh, Micklean Thomas and some of the younger artists uh, Kindy Wiley and so forth first she uh, is a brilliant beautiful smart woman uh, we've had a, a number of shows together and uh, 
And this work has been shown a number of times. And I think if there is a work that grabs you and that sort of says it all about her work, this is it. So look at what she's done here. First, this is felt, right? Felt. When we see felt, I think most of us think about immediately being in grade school, like second, third, fourth grade, where you're cutting out felt things and making stuff. So it's a material that sort of feels warm and fuzzy. Uh, second of all, you look at this and you see all these back of hairs. Okay? And what she does then is shake us up, like Kinder Whitey, like everyone in this show, with how we have stereotypes and reactions, assumptions and presumptions, that we as human beings are natural. But then what she does is she catches us and makes us think about how we react and our thoughts and our values. Because when you look at this, don't you jump to the conclusion that these are African-American black women's hair. And probably many of them probably are. Some of them may not be. But you jump to that conclusion and then she really shakes us up with this Claire I'll add, the blonde hair right there, just to again, force us to see the reaction of how we think. Okay. And I think what's deeper about this is, I'm sure everyone who looks at this, once they see an image, not only thinks about the hair, but you begin to um, develop uh, a thought process about who it is that that hair is attached to and who that person is, what they're like, what she does. <coughs> and. Uh, then on top of that, she then has all these little statements, these little poetic things. Uh, if the shoe fits, wear it. Uh, I mean, she's again trying to get us to focus on these preconceived notions that we have. And for those of us that may believe that we uh, are totally gender blind and racial blind and, and religious blind and whatever, as human beings, we all fall into traps where we do get into a pattern of thoughts and that's why artists, as chroniclers of our time, this is what they're supposed to do. Force us to look at our own values, our societal values, our family values, and think about are the values that we think we have the values that we really feel and practice in our lives day to day. So if we want to focus again on, as, as Joanne has mentioned, uh, when this show opened up, it was right before the Black Lives Matter movement started. And that movement has, the constructive part of it has, helped the consciousness of this country realize uh, the issues of white supremacy and racism and uh, gender inequality, uh, a number of things. And those are important things. As a country made up of individuals, each of us want to become the best we can be. We want to have attitudes that we're proud of, values that we're proud of, attitudes and values that we pass on to our children and they pass on to their children. And it's an artist like this, Lorna Simpson, that helps us with this social commentary uh, in such a powerful way, uh, help us define and redefine our values. So Nicola Lopez who was born in Santa Fe where her mother still lives and actually right now during the COVID pandemic, she's staying for the last three months with her son Amadeus. I first saw her work maybe 15 years ago and what I loved about her work was these very strong architectural forms. Uh, being in the real estate business, I love urban planning and seeing how cities are built and also being a student of history, wondering uh, you know, what in 100 years and 300 and 500 years our cities will look like and whether we will be buried under tons of rock and sand like places in Rome and Egypt and other places like that. So she has a phenomenal way of taking uh, the organic and the man-made objects and <laughs> like an erector set that you pour on the floor that you're going to make objects she mixes and matches all this stuff up and this was a piece that was at the print fair about 10 years ago it was featured on the front page of the new york times uh, uh, as being the most one of the most important pieces at the art fair and quickly i called up and bought it this is the second or third time it's been exhibited um, she does these big installations as well as, you know, lots of prints and, uh, and other uh, sculptures and forms. Brilliant lady. She teaches at Columbia uh, and uh, 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 there's a major piece of hers in the Metropolitan Museum. She was chosen in the members lounge that covered all the walls that we also bought. And uh, so when I look at these, I think about time and place and I think about well, is this what happens to America's cities? Do we end up through whatever 
climate change issues, war, whatever, end up just all becoming um, uh, broken pieces of cities. Like when we see the images of Syria and other places that have been bombed. Uh, you know, is this what's left when we're all gone? Is this is the legacy we're leaving? Uh, what do you like about this well, piece? Uh, you hit on a very important point and that is we're all thinking about climate change um, constantly nowadays and I feel like Nicola Lopez gives us a little um, a little bit of hope in this installation that's titled Half-Life so to me the way I read the installation which is made of mylar which is an innovative uh, material to use I like to think of it as a statement that nature will prevail no matter what happens. So it's almost as though there's a city that's fallen into disrepair and disarray and everything's crumbling, but nature finds a way of taking a hold and coming back. And so it's a little, a bit of hope that the artist is presenting us at the same time that she's commenting about climate change. She's taking these, um we would call black pickaninny kind of young uh, African American young girls and, and these stereotype kind of things and um, uh, just filled with um, uh, with um, um, themes of the keys and uh, uh, mirrors and whatever. Uh, this one uh, at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at Portland State University that opened up uh, last December. Uh, the initial show, the curator picked work from my collection and uh, picked this one, but didn't want this one because it was called, what's it called, To Kill? Sometimes I Want to Kill You, and she was too afraid that that was uh, going to be too controversial, which, whatever. So I'm delighted you had them both here. I've since bought two more. As I suggested before, not to be redundant on it, the key what these artists want is to stop in your tracks, look at their work, and think. And as to what you think is unique to you. So whatever you see in this and whatever, uh, at least she's got you thinking about something. Well, there's a piece where I drive, I was going to say Ellen Gallagher. Uh, uh, this piece of hers, um, uh, 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 she took that abusim of the Egyptian uh, thing that was uh, had to be moved up because of the Aswan Dam uh, and a flying saucer. But her most famous work is, uh, what, the 60 pieces, they were ebony covers, okay? And... Um, she took these ebony covers and she manipulated each one with sort of clay and stuff in front of them. And uh, like ads were, uh, this is an ad to whiten your skin. This was an ad for straightening your hair. So all these things that uh, Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine focused on in the uh, early 50s when Mr. Johnson started the Ebony Magazine and so forth. And um, uh, that piece is 60 and it's huge. And uh, she just hits you with the hypocrisy of media trying to convince American black men and women that who they are and how they look isn't good enough, that they need to look more white to be uh, accepted more. It's a super powerful set. Uh, man, deluxe, deluxe set, deluxe set. But this one I've seen before, and I'm not sure what to quite think about this. What, what, what do you think about this one? I'm, well, I know she was referencing um, black exploitation films um, of the 1970s, so it's really, um, you know, it's it's kind of a a, a statement about the times and and especially like the funkadelic like saucer, flying saucer. It, it all alludes to that time, and um, I'm not sure what to make of the nurses, though. First of all, these are called after Jean Michel. Basquiat, meaning these were, he had done these and then he died when he was 27, so the estate finished, just, just produced them. Um, but these are some of his most, uh, well, all of his images are famous now. So he was born in 1960 in Brooklyn, he had a tough time as a kid, uh, he was basically thrown out of the house and went on his own and he was about a sophomore, was a kid on the street, uh, got into art. And he was one of a number of people, like Keith Haring is the other biggest famous one with him, that did all the street art. So if you look at the books about him, my God, if it existed, whether it was a postal box, a, 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 a train car, side of a building, a garbage can, refrigerators, there's anything he didn't just start painting with this street art. And uh, he started with another a group of them, they began to get some real notoriety. Now. Um, uh, I think the reason why they got some notoriety is there were artists like Warhol and others that were senior to him that really encouraged that kind of freedom of expression coming out of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the 60s and again that Warhol theme of the democratization of art. 
so um, they began to get credibility and pretty soon he was represented by a gallery in New York and Larry Gagosian in LA and, and getting a lot, lot of credibility. Now they also led a pretty wild lifestyle. Uh, eventually he uh, overdosed at 27 and died uh, because uh, Warhol had died about a year before and uh, they'd gotten to be very close. They were close and they had their falling out and whatever and their issues whether they were romantically close or not romantically close or whatever, but Warhol sort of took him under his wing a lot and uh, I think he got very depressed with Warhol's death and that increased his heroin usage and he just uh, unfortunately died. Um, so I think what, uh, what he was focusing on is all those themes of the street, of society, of uh, uh, wealth and not wealth and uh, gender and inequality and uh, especially being a younger person we all know younger you tend to be more idealistic and so forth and they all reinforced each other there were a half dozen other names of people of artists that really have not gone anywhere they were all part of sort of a, a group and they all uh, you know hung out and partied and so forth so anyway, uh, he was, uh, now his paintings, I think one sold for 54 million. I mean, now he's jumped up with those big mega collectors and so forth. But he was a very inventive. I think what's a shame here about him, and we can say this also about people that we grew up with the music, like Janis Joplin or Jimi Hendrix or others that you guys may listen to once in a while about that old music. But it would have been neat. I mean, I wish Nat King Cole had lived longer, or Frank Sinatra. There are a lot of new songs. I wish we could have heard their interpretation of some of the newer songs. It would have been fascinating to have seen where his career would have gone uh, if he would have lived longer. But it was a bright flame and um, uh, someone coming from the street. And in contrast to these other folks, that most all of them were really well-educated with a, a BFA and an MFA, he was just uh, that, that genetic predisposition. So uh, uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating art. So if you look right now, and this was brilliant picking this, you were so prescient about the Black Lives Matter, is he did a series of the uh, reigning queens. So it's predictable, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Beatrice from Netherlands, or whatever the names are, uh, uh, Marguerite from Denmark, uh, another one, uh, uh, the Netherlands, whatever, but then what did, it, Queen Elizabeth, okay. okay. But then what does he do? He puts in two of the queens from Swaziland. You talk about way ahead, imagine in the, what attitudes were then about that, right? So in terms of that statement, he again, beautiful, master, master colorist, okay? And the way he would take these images and manipulate them, just brilliantly done, okay? So here he sucks us in with these, you know, contemporary uh, images of queens, back that portraiture thing of all those old fancy ones, whatever. And then what does he do? He puts in the two African-American black ladies, just to shake us up again about our attitudes about royalty. Way ahead of his time. Well, what else do you want to say about these? I think you said it. I, I like the fact that he used diamond dust in making some of them, and it's um, industrial grade diamonds that are ground down. That's why it's sparkly on some of yeah. them. So he went to, uh, he got this idea of using diamond dust, and he went to the jewelry uh, area of New York, and he actually got the diamond dust, and he tried to, put it on and he couldn't get it to stick. So in essence, what he really used was a polymer <laughs> uh, that was able to look like diamonds and sparkle, but, uh, but that was able to stick on the, on, the, on, the, on the prints. So what happens here is uh, he would come up with an image of what he wanted to do. And then he'd have it on the floor of the factory and Paige would say, he'd talk about what happened, he'd call people around and say, well here, I, I'm trying these colors here, these colors here, these colors here, what do you all think? You like this one better? Whatever. And they'd finally pick the colors they like that would be the addition set, and he'd make generally 150 of those. In the meantime, there were a bunch of these unique trial proofs, like these were, okay, that are really extra special, because <clears throat> it shows the process of how he got to the uh, final addition one. Uh, Hung Lu, uh, she was born in 48 in China. Uh, her parents in the Cultural Revolution were imprisoned and made to work on farms. Very difficult time. She uh, taught at Mills most of her life, uh, college, and uh, lives in Oakland. So what these are focusing on is, uh, first she uses a lot of traditional Asian Chinese themes of lotus, flowers, and birds, and, and uh, those very lovely sort of things that uh, we think of, uh, of Chinese heritage and Chinese art. And then she uses these faces that are so powerful. Actually, I mean, again, Joanne just did a brilliant job here. You think about those Kinda Wiley, now she's much older. She was born in 48, okay, and he was born in 77, I think it was. Uh, 
uh, and yet you look at those faces of those eyes and you look at these eyes and that determination yay, and these were people that somehow you know uh, 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 are surviving here's you know the thing you had to carry the little uh, not passport thing but identification cards uh, uh, that you had to have and um, you know that that massive time with Mao I mean there were millions of people that were killed and and uh, so this defiance, so here she's taking uh, a lot of traditional kinds of Chinese themes, of the lotus, the flowers, the birds, the mountains, whatever, and that these very contemporary, very contemporary portrait faces of fierce, determined uh, folks. And yet, in these faces, I think you see as I do, the anguish in their eyes, okay? I mean, you see a sorrow, you see a, 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 a listless i mean they're 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 determined but you see a not broken but but an anguished look whereas with the kinda wiley you see a fierce proud determined look uh, a defiant look whereas with these folks they were so broken down uh just just i mean just uh oh, haunting just haunting okay i mean these the kinda wileys and so forth i think are sort of inspiring okay they're powerful these are haunting and you just uh, it's like you're it's like you're reaching inside their hearts and feeling their pain as a, as a human being of someone else that's gone through a difficult time these Mil Mildred Howard so these are done by uh, these are done by tandem uh, and uh, I think it's a uh, well she did this series here at Beyonce this was the outfit Beyonce wore when she was the at the Super Bowl the entertainer so here she plucks her down on this Civil War scene, you know, from uh, uh, Harper's Bazaar, what, I mean, Harper's, you know, the, the magazine, like the Care Walker used so much of and whatever. And so here she's showing this sort of, you know, defiant, but she's in that outfit with all the sort of bullets and whatever and so forth and that, again, that juxtaposition of those, you know, two. Uh, these, uh, I think this is fabulous because, uh, <clears throat> So that word game is really important in her, her lingo. So uh, what Mildred Howard says is we've been gamed long enough in terms of African-American black women, and therefore she's putting these women in these gorgeous antebellum kind of dresses and whatever uh, with the bingo card saying bingo, 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 bingo. Uh, and that sort of uh, imagery, ah, fascinating. Uh, Jacob Lawrence um, was sort of at this point the granddaddy of a lot of these younger folks. And without him, he taught at the University of Washington. He died about 10, uh, 2000. Um, uh, he did a huge series um, when there was a great migration of African-American folks from the South to the North in 1719 for World War I. Uh, he did an amazing series of all that. The Smithsonian only owns half, and like the Modern Museum owns half. And I saw a couple years ago at the Modern Museum, all of them together, which they'd only been like once or twice before. But um, I mean, he shows uh, images of, 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 of um, his culture, his history, and uh, and uh, paved the way uh, for uh, Robert Colescott, an artist, my mother's gallery that now has a huge exhibition, and 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 a lot of these younger folks that build upon uh, uh, the legacy of those earlier artists.